Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to CANDU's Links to Learning webinar series today. For those new to the series, we host these um, Links to Learning webinars every Tuesday from three to four Mountain Standard Time. Uh, we touch base on numerous different topics, so we welcome you to visit our website to see our upcoming schedule. My name is Elizabeth Callahayson. I work from Edmonton at CANDU, located on Treaty 6 territory and welcome you here and thank you for joining us. Um, today's webinar um, is called Regional Project Readiness Planning. This webinar will describe how communities can mitigate some of the risks that accompany major development projects while realizing long-term community goals. By developing region-based readiness plans early in the project cycle, an effective readiness strategy can help ensure a development project demonstrates environmental, social, and economic sustainability throughout its life cycle. And project investments help to build transferable skills and knowledge within the local economy to benefit communities for many years following project closure. Now we welcome, we'd like to welcome our speaker today, Jason Petrunia. He is an experienced strategist, regional and urban planner, and social performance specialist. He assists his clients realize innovations in region and city building, benefit sharing and management of risk and impacts within resource, industrial infrastructure and urban investment projects. He brings experience from across Canada and internationally in environmental and social governance, urban planning and community development. He is adept at working in a collaborative, technically informed framework that allows effective decision making. Thank you, Jason, for joining us today. And I'd like to pass the virtual mic on to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, good to uh, meet everybody today. And uh, as Elizabeth indicated, I'm gonna be going over a, uh, uh, a couple of, uh, I guess, case studies on regional readiness uh, that describe, uh, you know, different approaches to achieving that with, uh, with uh, community input. So um, I've got a, a deck that I'll go through. And if there are any questions, um, I think, you know, the format is that there's a Q&A after the presentation, but please throw up your hand if you have questions and I'll try and, uh, and uh, address those as I go through the presentation. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. One second. So you should now see the full presentation in front of you. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Um, <clears throat> got a thumbs up, so thank you. So I just, I'm gonna go over, uh, just to give you a brief introduction as to what, what I do and, and what my colleagues at Land and People do. And, and get into a bit of a description on what, what is resource readiness and talk about some of the case studies and then just provide some additional background information for you um, just in terms of other uh, resources that you may be able to tap into for, for community readiness uh, initiatives. Uh, so Land and People Planning is a majority indigenous owned boutique planning and development firm. And our focus is really on improving project sustainability through greater participation and interaction with impacted communities. And we specialize in economic development, procurement, uh, ESG and social management, consultation and facilitation and urban planning and design. Our president is uh, Peter Tapatai. You can see a picture of him here. Uh, he's based out of Baker Lake, uh, Nunavut. And uh, he's been working with uh, the resource sector for over 25 years um, and has an extensive track record in developing uh, 
collaborative partnerships with, with uh, communities, uh, mining companies, governments, uh, as the case may be. Uh, so he's, uh, he often shares his success stories uh, from community to community um, and uh, is an advocate for uh, community-based uh, approaches to, uh, uh, to resource development. Uh, his claim to fame is that he is the, uh, if anybody remembers uh, CDC cartoon from the 1970s, The Great Shamu. Uh, he was the, uh, the character that voiced The Great Shamu and that the, the character is based on. So he's, he's uh, well known within Nunavut um, uh, amongst that generation. Um, so the question that we put out there today is why resource project readiness and, and some of the key sort of pragmatic elements come out just with respect to timelines. Um, and, you know, looking at it from the perspective of industry, for example, uh, often industry is, is hard pressed to meet both the regulatory requirements or the regulatory timelines of their projects as well as meet what would be considered uh, a participatory approach to engagement um, with communities within, within project development. So this is really the, the balance um, that projects across Canada are attempting to strike at the moment with respect to uh, working with communities in developing projects while also trying to meet their own internal timelines. Uh, uh, whether those are driven by investors or by regulatory processes. Um, so one of, the, one of the items that can benefit a project around community engagement is, is around uh, joint risk identification. So working with communities to assess what potential risks are. And, and this has a big impact um, currently within Canada, especially around issues of materiality or how how companies disclose what are what may be potential risks to their to their projects or to their operations. Um, <clears throat> within that work with communities, um, there there can also be a, an effort put forward to identify action or management plans, and uh, those can often be the risk mitigating uh, frameworks that uh, really show investors and show their stakeholders how they are mitigating risks that may be uh, inherent within their projects. Also, as people are likely familiar with, there's the whole benefit and, and agreement side of the equation. And uh, that's obviously a big part of why industry engages and uh, can engage in different ways in, in a readiness framework. Uh, within, within, on the community side and, and in terms of in, supporting community participation, one of the focus points that uh, we're hearing a lot more about is around this notion of closing the service gap. So how can these projects um, be utilized to better inform how communities um, assert their, their ability to uh, um, capture more services within their communities? So whether they're social services or business services or health services, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, often this is within a framework of community well-being, uh, which is important in terms of understanding where communities are currently at and where they may be um, uh, looking to get to in, in the future. And uh, ideally with the support of uh, projects that are located within their regions. And associated with those are, are governance models. And, a readiness framework really helps to assist in determining appropriate governance models, whether they're, you know, uh, to cover agreements, community-based agreements, or other uh, related businesses or uh, other community organizations that may be necessary to meet uh, the or engage with with projects in in the in uh, in, in a community's uh, uh, within the, the region that. Uh, that a community would be uh, located within. Um, <clears throat> and really the, the focus here for industry is that if, if they're supporting communities towards uh, community well-being, they will be increasing a community's readiness and increasing participation within their project. So it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a give and take 
kind of process. And we, we know that within, again, within the Canadian context that there are, are levers that the community can apply uh, to really increase their position within a, a, an industrial approach to project establishment. And we're seeing that a lot in the discussions around ESG uh, within, within the Canadian context and the movement to a more appropriate ESG framework within, within the Canadian context. And one of the key things there is you know, shifting from aspirational to measurable disclosure. And, and this is really in, with respect to corporate reporting, but also understanding what is material risk, as I, as I alluded to earlier, within, within those corporate reports. Uh, and the other, the other aligned shift there is around framing activities beyond just commercial transactions. So it's really uh, delving more into the relationship between projects and communities that, uh, that um, are, are going to be at the core of these uh, emerging ESG frameworks. Um, in addition to that, there's the Sustainable Development Goals and uh, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the Canadian context. So these also increase the focus, uh, increase focus of investors, regulatory bodies, and other stakeholders on risk and impact to Indigenous communities. Um, <clears throat> and a big part of that is, is uh, from an from a organizational perspective, is understanding what that risk might look like. So, um, again, readiness plays a hugely important role in, in that process. So um, <clears throat> when we look at this readiness approach, uh, one, of the, one of the key uh, incentives for industry to take this on is to incorporate it into their risk management framework. And it is a way for both the organization and communities to reduce risk. It is a way for both to align outcomes and it's a eff more effective way to communicate results. And, um, you know, there's a bit of a, a framework there that, um, uh, that you, you can see in terms of the, the different stakeholders that, that might be interested in different aspects of, a, of an ESG framework and in terms of reporting and outcomes uh, that they would, they would look to, to gain from a, an investment project within, within a region. We also know this from work that we've done with uh, organization, industrial organizations like uh, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada. Um, they've looked at readiness more broadly um, and, uh, and uh, we helped them just look at some of the risk and impact of exploration projects within Indigenous communities. And uh, what is aligned within a readiness framework is really that, that core understanding of how to work with communities around opportunity identification, around key challenges, around risk, and around uh, potential strategies for success. And these resources are available online and we'll be happy to share those with you. <clears throat> uh, also with uh, PDAC, we've, we've looked at um, sort of a framework around key activities uh, that would support community readiness. Um, so looking at different communities within an economic region and how they may engage and participate with projects. So you can see here in the case for mining, it goes from the pre-exploration phase through exploration, development, operation, closure, and post-closure. There are activities that uh, align with each of those phases that uh, communities can um, prepare for and engage with industry to, um, uh, to deliver services or participate within. Um, and this has a, a fundamental impact on when engagement should start and how that should be resourced. Uh, and that's a big aspect of industry community um, discussions. Uh, in this case, there is a focus on careers in mineral development, but certainly uh, those careers uh, are, are and need to be based on transferable skill sets between mining and other resource activities. Uh, certainly, there's an emphasis on economic development and closely associated with that uh, uh, community business development. So that's just sort of setting the stage for 
for uh, regional uh, project readiness. And uh, what I'm going to do now is just take you through a few case studies and um, just to give you a sense of how that how we've done that or practice that uh, with, with some of our clients. So uh, this is an example from Northwest Alberta. It, uh, at that time, was called the Tri-Municipal Industrial District. And it was a um, uh, consortium of three local municipal governments, so the City of Grand Prairie, the County of Grand Prairie, and the Municipal District of Greenview. And they are looking to establish and bring forward a new gas processing district in Northwest Alberta. So this, this project was really looking at how they can provide more value added within their economic region. And, um, <clears throat> and that involved a number of key aspects that uh, many of you would be familiar with around you know, land acquisition and, uh, and requirements around Indigenous consultation. Um, there were seven Indigenous communities involved uh, that were directly impacted by the project, but uh, there were several more that were indirectly impacted. Um, in the end, we had well over 40 Indigenous and industrial stakeholders that uh, were um, brought to a table to discuss some of the different impacts and opportunities associated with this project. And I'll, I'll go through that a little bit with you. Um, in the end, the, the province has uh, moved this project forward um, and it is now um, uh, gaining, recently gaining two uh, major investments uh, within, within its, its uh, plan boundary. So you can see here the uh, actual location is just south of Grand Prairie, and and the uh, the graphic on the on the right just really represents the kind of uh, um, different phasing that the lands would would go through potentially to accommodate different uh, value added processing uh, within that area. Uh, the idea here is that it's because its location is uh, close to a number of uh, large pipelines and feedstock for uh, of natural gas that it made a lot of sense for value added processing to be located here because of the bottlenecks and distribution challenges facing uh, downstream users. Uh, so this is a way to, to cut out and uh, and go closer to the source for the feedstock. And it also benefited from the fact that there is highway infrastructure power infrastructure and rail infrastructure to get goods to market. So it was uh, seen by industry as an attractive location uh, to set up this, this kind of district. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to begin to tell a story so that it wasn't just about, um, um, you know, industry, um, you know, acquiring land or controlling land, but it was it was more about the opportunities that were available if this uh, could reach, um, if, if the development or the district could be realized through through partnerships with with uh, various stakeholders in, in the region. So one of the things that we did was was to construct a uh, a number of different scenarios, and you, you can see on the left here. Uh, we went through a modeling exercise where we looked at the number of different projects that may be attracted to uh, the district. And there is any, anywhere from four to eight different projects that, that would be interested in potentially investing in the district. And that represented a capital expenditure of anywhere from 5.2 to 6 billion. Um, and an operating expenditure of 1.3 to 1.5 billion. So, uh, the numbers are quite significant when, when looking at the potential investments in, in the district. Um, and associated with, with the financial investment was the on-site construction workforce or the, the construction investment and associated job creation, uh, anywhere from 65 to 8,000 jobs. And then during operations phase, the direct operations workforce, so from 9 
950 to 1100. Um, <clears throat> so that really, that really set the stage for creating these scenarios. So essentially we broke down the kind of um, uh, benchmark industrial investments behind some of the, the key industries that would be located there and then extruded from there a, a scenario around uh, job creation within the construction phase and, and um, resultant population growth, and also job creation within the operations phase and resultant uh, population growth. So you can see the differences in those numbers. So this is looking at the potential and then trans translating that potential into actual uh, job numbers within each of the different phases. Uh, we also went and looked at it in terms of a uh, breakdown of a GDP spend. So looking at a total spend from construction and then a, a spend annually within operations. And again, looking at the two, the two a range there in terms of investment potential within, within the district. Again, these numbers are significant and um, it, it really um, situated the, the potential, but also framed the challenges uh, in particular, at looking at it from the community perspective. So how, how are communities supposed to get up to a position where they can engage either in the job aspect the, or the, uh, the supply, supplier aspect of, of these different, uh, different opportunities? And part of what we worked on with, with our client was really to establish a, a project execution plan that put the collaboration component as a core work stream. So they were in the process of looking at different options around what kind of entity would be required to administer this area. Uh, they, they had capital requirements around land and infrastructure <clears throat> and regulatory requirements as well around uh, local planning and uh, utilities. Um, and we immersed a uh, really a collaboration strategy within that to say that the readiness strategy would be critical to ensuring that communities were able to engage with the diff other different work components that went into the project. And, and a big part of that was understanding what needed to be met from the perspective of the community within certain stage gates so that uh, uh, those requirements could be fulfilled before the project moved on to its next phase. And so this was a key part of ensuring that um, um, the decision makers around the table understood what was necessary uh, to make decisions before you could before you could move from one phase to the next. Um, <clears throat> other as aspects of work that we've looked at would be around supporting companies in terms of understanding supplier readiness. So taking the, the previous example, you know, if you have this kind of expenditure either in capital works or in, in operating your business, there's a, an associated procurement spend that goes along with that. And with these large projects, you typically have a very short timeline to submit um, tenders. So as a community-based business or an indigenous-led business, you know, if you're invited to bid on a project, you may only have two to four weeks to submit before the deadline. Um, <clears throat> if you're not pre-qualified, you have to do and meet all of those bid requirements within that time frame, and that really creates a lot of pressure and uh, usually results in a in a poor bid process from the perspective of the vendor. Uh, whereas if you're pre-qualified, that gives you a little more time to focus on the unique aspects to each of the bid, and gives you a little more time to review and submit your bid as well. Um, but we know from those larger projects that. As they, as they get more and more complex, you know, you need more time to put into your bids to get ready for those. And 
And um, that, that time that's spent in preparing for those bids may be within your business itself, or it may be within the partnerships that you strive to, um, uh, to realize with, with uh, um, more uh, seasoned uh, partners to, in order to uh, create the uh, conditions for a more successful bid. And that, that's really about supplier readiness and screening. So understanding who your partners may be, ensuring that they have the same values as your community-based business and ensuring that you have the right uh, agreements in place um, to guide decision-making with respect to, to the uh, consortium that, that, is, that you are uh, pulling together. And that, that, generally speaking, is the readiness piece for suppliers. Um, it's a time commitment and has to be thought out in advance of those major capital projects or operation works that may be uh, locating or currently located within, within your regions. Uh, another example that um, I can pull from here is, the, is an example from Northern Ontario. And this was a a resource readiness strategy that we helped facilitate with a with Council Site First Nation and uh, with other local communities that were uh, within the vicinity of several uh, projects that were in advanced exploration. And the work here was was really to establish a, a roadmap on how communities could become resource ready. And uh, we did that through a facilitated engagement process um, that was time intensive, and uh, uh, but set the stage for a, a, a good roadmap for how the community, uh, in this case, the First Nation community saw itself in terms of uh, the development of, of these different projects within its region. Uh, so this is in Northern Ontario along Highway 11. Um, and uh, you can see here, there's the town of Hearst, which is a Francophone community. Um, and then the, the community of Constance Lake, uh, which is the First Nation community just west of, of Hearst. And there are two projects in, in the region. Uh, one, I'll describe them later. One's Al the Albany Graphite Project. The other one's a, a phosphate project. But this is a good example because it, it affects and is uh, representative of the sort of boreal region across Canada and all the various resources that uh, are within that boreal corridor. Um, <clears throat> and there's challenges that communities within that corridor face from resource development. And, and one of those key challenges is around timelines and, and when and how projects will start and, um, and how to plan for those starts. And then once those projects are initiated, often the demands of those projects can be overwhelming to local communities. So readiness is about building that capacity to, um, to uh, engage and uh, participate within those projects. And uh, it's, it's something that uh, in our opinion can't be started too early. Um, <clears throat> from a community perspective, uh, there's many challenges in preparing for some of these larger resource projects, uh, you know, around training, skills development, access to housing or infrastructure. Um, a lot of that is tied up in community well-being. Um, alignment of work or business with, with traditional practices, uh, personal finances and financial literacy, health and wellness within communities, and um, uh, uh, community skills training and, and, and upskilling. And one of the key challenges is really, we, we put the project cycle up here just to remind our audi different audiences that, you know, within the pre-exploration phase, a lot of the activity is funded by government. In the pre-development phase, and in, into the development phase, it's really a combination of funds that are available that, that uh, push these projects forward. And those are through the 
the private sector, but also uh, government and uh, community funds as well. And um, once you get into production, you know, you're really, this is a, a cost component for project development. So money doesn't start coming in until the production phase. That phase compared to the expiration and closure phase is a much smaller component. So uh, it's, a, it's a small window and one where there's a lot of um, expectations put onto an operating project from the investments that have gone in prior to, and then in terms of money that needs to be put back into the site to uh, bring it up to uh, regulatory requirements on remediation and closure and what have you. Uh, so in this case, there were two projects, uh, both in that uh, advanced feasibility stage. One, which is probably near, which is the Albany project. Uh, you can see it's a, it's a near, near community project or community is within a relatively close distance to that uh, asset. Uh, but one of the, still one of the key challenges is around understanding timelines associated with these projects. So this just shows you, you know, the, you know, between 500 and 1,000 grassroots exploration projects, you really get one producing mine out of that initial sort of or broad-based discovery phase. So we look at the project that is close to Constance Lake, it's an advanced exploration, you're, you're still in a one in 100, uh, probability of that project coming to fruition. So there's a lot of talk about exploration work, a lot of talk about the benefits of resource development, but often that is um, mediated through, through the market and, and uh, the market uh, really likes uh, only a few projects uh, to, uh, to support in terms of um, getting them through to a, a developing asset. Um, so one of the things that we, we have done with, with the community is to really focus efforts, not just on, on the shiny object of this, of this mining project, but to say, okay, what else can the community do in the meantime to be prepared and be ready? And, um, and there's been other uh, opportunities for this community, uh, Council's Lake, to focus on their social development and well-being initiatives, to focus on other economic development initiatives to focus on some of the business uh, ready um, elements that, such as housing construction that they may be able to uh, participate in. So a key part of this is understanding that the resource readiness piece was a community led component and led by the indigenous community. And the vision that was put out was put out by that community and by, by its chief and council. Uh, this is just an example of the, um, the vision statement that came out of that process. And, and this took about two years of engagement to get to a stage where the community was uh, comfortable with, uh, with the vision that was put out. And then there are a number of principles that, um, that are also, sorry, I'm just gonna try and get down the background noise. A number of principles that are also supportive of the plan so uh, securing social license to operate, retaining investment, building transferable skill sets, diversifying and increasing innovation, aligning project investment with local community needs, planning and building infrastructure in an incremental and scalable manner, and um, looking at how efforts are made to sustainably manage the resource. So uh, again, these are all informed by the community and uh, and were put at the forefront in consultation with the, the owner of the mining projects, with provincial represent, represent, representatives, uh, and with the, uh, uh, with the other local communities as well. Uh, generally speaking, a lot of the questions from the community were about when this project would start. And, it, and I'm sure you've seen that in your own communities uh, when there's discussion about potential investment, it's when, when does it come and uh, how do I get involved? How do I work there? 
these are all sort of some of the common questions that come out of the community and and expectation management, as you know, in that scenario becomes a very real uh, subject. Uh, you know, it's been now four years since the completion of that readiness initiative and that project is still in advanced exploration. So um, it's, it's often a fine balance between running out and getting, you know, uh, trained in for mining jobs that may not appear within your within your community. So uh, one of the key approaches here is to ensure that you're looking at not just one project, but you're looking at the economy of the region more generally. Um, <clears throat> so when we're looking at mining, me, when we're looking at mining, we're looking at, and this is the same for many of the resource projects, um, that would be found within that Mid-Canada corridor. You're really looking at the different kinds of labor, equipment, and material requirements that are required within each of the phases and breaking those down and understanding how community-based businesses can engage in, in, in delivering those different aspects to these projects. Um, <clears throat> there's also more specific activities that happen within each of the phases. And again, any, any project can be broken down in a similar manner to understand where the service demands will be and uh, where a community uh, may be able to engage and participate in, in supporting the, the delivery of those services. Um, <clears throat> so in this, in this situation, we really looked at some of the economic reports for that project um, and, and uh, uh, you know, created a better or framed a, the understanding of what the market would be. And, and for those of you who are following the sort of green transformation and all the discussion about uh, critical minerals and supply chains necessary for the greening of the economy, uh, this is one of those products. And one of the key challenges with these products is that there's no commodity market for them. So you you know, there's, the projects have difficult raising capital because it's, it's not a well understood commodity. Uh, and so they need to do things like research, they need to, they need to figure out where it could be, what, what industrial applications it could be used in. Um, and most importantly, they typically get investment through offtake agreements or agreements with that are direct to uh, uh, consumers. So in this case, they would be striving to get an agreement with Tesla to secure a certain um, amount of graphite that could be delivered to uh, that uh, manufacturer. Uh, and those, those agreements take time and they're, they're, they're difficult to, um, uh, to get into place. Um, <clears throat> having said that, there's still the, the actual uh, capital and operating components of these projects, and those are readily available within the economic reports. Uh, in this case, a $2 billion capital expenditure, uh, sorry, total expenditure of $2 billion, uh, 0.7 billion in capital costs and 1.3 in, in operating costs and a life of mine of 22 years. So we really like to understand what does that mean in terms of a project spend over its life cycle? And you can, you can see where the capital costs are dwindling down over time, but still, still present. And uh, the operating costs, which kick in after the construction phase is complete and, um, and run in parallel with those capital expenditures. And in association with that spend, you can understand where the job creation occurs and what that curve looks like. Uh, through that through that life of mine and and there's also estimates that can be made around services so everything from fabrication through to small parts and equipment and the different ex annual expenditures of each of those service offerings um, and then this is actually flipped um, sorry it should be red at the bottom but this is um, um, you know we're looking at there's really low opportunities for most of the services until you get to the development and production phases. So they, 
they go from few opportunities, more opportunities, highest opportunities, and then drifting down again. It's really pretty straightforward. But what we like to do with the community is to determine what sort of targets they feel they, they would like to uh, set um, to ensure that they're working towards a state of readiness or an ability to engage and participate in, in projects. And, and a lot of this is typically or conventionally contained in IBAs. Um, um, and those are, this doesn't preclude that, it just uh, opens up a more community informed process for understanding the different uh, kinds of um, services that could be um, delivered within the community based on opportunities associated with that specific project or, or associated with the economic region that the community is located within. Um, and in this case, the community was looking at, well, we don't, maybe we can, we can strive to get more junior companies to come to our region, reach more exploration agreements with those companies is an example of that. Uh, and then as you go through the project cycle, you're really looking at different kinds of agreements and, and different, different types of, uh, um, um, based, on, based on more granular understanding of, of what the projects are. Um, interestingly here, they, they did establish targets for direct, <coughs> direct jobs and uh, indirect or indirect contract jobs induced and also on supplier end. So just these numbers alone help the community understand, okay, what are, we, what are we trying to achieve within our region in terms of getting our community members to a state where they're ready to engage in this project? And the idea is that based on these targets, you can then work backwards to establish the, the the specific actions that would be necessary to to meet those uh, meet those targets. Um, <clears throat> so we typically create social impact within these projects by thinking outside of the box, by focusing on where housing and infrastructure development can be aligned to best um, engage with communities. So they get intergenerational training and capacity building to facilitate business development and to look at different community investment and support mechanisms that may come from um, a project or several projects that operate in the region. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, we the, the desire of the community was to have most of, rather than having a fly in, fly out situation that they, they desired to have most of the, the uh, workforce uh, to be located within within the region itself, and and as representatives of resource communities, you know how how difficult that can be. Uh, so it's an ambitious target, but one that the community felt strongly that they wanted to have realized. Um, <clears throat> and a big part of that is um, again understanding is that a real, realistic target? Um, what is the potential within the region? And as as you know, this population pyramid is fairly representative broadly of indigenous communities across the boreal region compared to conventional communities, which are tend to be aging. Uh, so there's a real sort of uh, potential alignment here of, that's fairly obvious to um, um, uh, <laughs> people who understand the situation in the boreal corridor that uh, the future is really within, within these, uh, uh, within the youth and, and uh, younger generations within Indigenous communities. Um, <clears throat> so part of the equation is really to understand how investment here can help build healthy communities and healthy families. And there's so social investments that can be made within, within the community. Um, investment in participation and how participation can be accommodated within Indigenous communities. And also to understand where infrastructure can be uh, aligned with, with those uh, communities as well. And in this case, we're looking at um, <clears throat> the labor spend. So uh, this is construction workforce, this is operation, this is the contractors, and these are the indirect and induced 
uh, components of that project. And there's, you said, you know, a forecast a $20 million spend annually on labor within that, pro within that one project. So this is a key number to work towards in terms of understanding how to get ready to um, capture more of that investment. Uh, and that can be done through work workforce training programs and supplier readiness initiatives. Um, on, the, on the growth end, so that construction workforce, that operations workforce, those contractors, those indirect and induced workers all need a place to live. They need a place to uh, set up their business. They need a, a home for their families if they're there for the long term. Uh, so just looking at the housing component, this could be a uh, uh, 3 million annual spend just on housing. And uh, we know that there, there are forms that traditionally align best with certain elements of the construction workforce, for example, typically end up in camps. Um, there may be different forms of, of camps that are less temporary. Uh, through to operations and longer term staff, which may be more interested in, in housing, uh, permanent housing. Um, what we've done in the past is to help communities think through how you could take a, um, a direct project spend, say on construction housing, uh, that could be used and transferred once that construction workforce is, is finished, that could be transferred into a community use. So in this case, going from a construction workforce to seniors housing through uh, a lodge type uh, development. So again, you need time to build these uh, models and to work with different project components to understand how those could be realized within your region. Uh, this is just another example, looking again at that, that typical construction camp. Well, maybe you locate it and provide uh, and service it such that when those when those uh, trans trans um, when those trailers are moved out, uh, that that central amenity can stay, and that housing can be built around that central amenity. Just another example of how capital costs can be used for long term benefit of, of communities, and we can look at other other options within house house designs uh, as well. I won't spend too much time going through these. I know that we're running out here. So this is just a few examples of the different uh, uh, innovations, I guess, in thinking about project and community alignment that within a readiness approach, in other words, building the time in to understand community needs and working with projects that uh, uh, those could maybe be uh, realized uh, through the development and operation of a project. And I'd just like to point out that there are other, other resources available, you know, around uh, ed community-based education within STEM programs through Relay Education, financial literacy through CPA Canada, community support through CASO, um, mining and other resource-related training and education through organizations such as Mining Matters. Um, that's all for today. Um, so if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Awesome. Thank you, Jason, for that presentation. Very informative. And I feel like we can expand more on a couple of the um, capacity knowledge there that you're sharing. We'd be happy to discuss that further. But are there any questions or comments that we have for Jason? I gave us so much information and insight um, this presentation, along with the uh, presentation copy, will be available on the Candy website. Are there no questions, comments? Hi, it's okay. Helen here. I, I do have one. Hi, Beth, by the way. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, great presentation. Thank you, Jason. I just had a question and it kind of goes back to um, the um, uh, the case study that you uh, shared earlier about um, the uh, Tri-Council, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. in, in, um, in Alberta. And I was just curious if you'd expand a little bit more on the, uh, the um, governance model of how that was uh, set up. Um, 
yeah okay so this was this project is still in in um, process so at our the governance model that there's several layers i guess that you can look at with the governance model in this a district like this so it's uh, currently um the way uh, that we had set it out initially and i'd say initially set out we were once COVID hit we, the uh like many gas producing regions they lost uh, uh, quite a bit of revenue during that period and so a lot of the projects were put on hold or put on ice and uh, this one was sort of down scaled you could say uh, and so they're now uh, it's now just wholly under the MD of Greenview. Uh, so it's actually a good question because you could say that the governance model wasn't in place soon enough to tackle uh, crisis sufficiently. So the, the pandemic resulted in an, their initial collaboration and in MOU actually falling apart. And this is a problem that uh, is relevant for many of these larger projects, right? So getting an early MOU in place and getting an early decision-making framework in place that could um, basically, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, navigate some of those, some of the difficulties that especially in, in the various, whether it's health-related, uh, uh, pandemic related uh, disruptions or other sort of cyclical disruptions on, on the economic end. But having said that, the, the way the collaboration piece was set out is that there would be uh, really a stratification of the different opportunities here. And that's still likely in play, Helen, but I, I can't I can't speak to it because it's we're no we're no longer involved in this project. Yeah. But the the way it was set out was that you, you have some very you have some critical components. So there is obviously the infrastructure and the utility side that's associated with this kind of district. So um, there is an obvious um, uh, governance piece that would be associated with the distribution of or the, the construction and operation of utilities. So energy, water are two examples of where uh, you would have two different um, entities that would be um, overseeing those, those specific utilities. And the idea is that that's really where you'd stri strike out and, and get partners to bring on side from, um, from Indigenous communities that wanted to participate in those projects. Uh, and that those, those models would be structured, or those governance models would be structured such that they could accommodate the kind of uh, capacity of Indigenous communities to engage in, in that kind of uh, that kind of uh, uh, infrastructure delivery. Um, so there's the utilities and then there's the, the general services that the district would require. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, maintenance and operation requirements just with all the, the various road, rail and other infrastructure components. Uh, so those would also be tied up into different agreements uh, with, uh, with local community members. Uh, there's and then there's the capital side. So construction of uh, new interchanges, construction of new roads, all of those pieces could be uh, broken out and um, and really um, uh, developed with uh, with community-based partners. So the idea was that you you know at the outset that um, you know you sort of set the table. You talk about the different opportunities, and all of these models are based on that sort of round table, right? Having, having the different stakeholders from the region at the table, having everybody hear one story about this project, having the interaction be out in the open and then have the opportunities um, uh, put out for, um, uh, you know, as, as a sort of interest piece by different community-based organizations to gauge their interest in, in, in participating in in the different levels uh, that that of of, uh, of opportunity that would be available to them. So I don't know. If that's a long long way, but hopefully, and hopefully that somewhat answers your question. Yeah. Thanks for for elaborating and and yeah. And as I of course 
COVID has um, been problematic for so many collaborations and keeping them going. But it'll be inter interesting to see if it picks up, this particular um, project picks up again and where they take what it. Has. Yeah, what it has. Yeah, it certainly has. It's now, like I said, it's 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 uh, recent announcements were for two um, two projects are setting up there. So I think it's about okay. four billion in anticipated investment. So that's really quite significant. So we're doing work now on the community end to assist with how they should better position themselves to engage in those opportunities, right? So I think there's the pressure has to come from both sides. So yeah. if, if, if you're not getting the kind of uptake you think you should get from projects, then um, it's always good to lay out your own roadmap of how you think projects should engage with you if you're if you're uh, representing a community in that in that process. And just just to make sure I've I've, I've understood this correctly, there, there isn't a joint governance model for this. It's at the moment. It's it's actually a, a I, I don't know. I can't right. uh, can't yeah. comment on it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for for, for uh, sharing uh, that. Yeah. This, uh, example on the other very helpful to see how the, the framework um, lays out across a, across an example so thank mm -hmm. you yeah hi jason um my name is sherry jimmy i'm the reeve of a rural municipality in northwest saskatchewan and mm -hmm. my uh, day job is um working as a consultant with our local first nations which yeah. i've done for 30 years i'm wondering if you have examples of an MOU that you would be able to share or point us in the direction of. Um, we're relatively new to the resource industry sector in this area, and the um, proponent uh, industry is, uh, is a SAG-D project and an oil company. And there are the main stakeholder group has been the rural municipality that I am elected to represent. However, um, industry is not, um, you know, engaged all of the partners that are within the area and our Indigenous partners came on after the fact, as did some of our other communities. Um, I can see from your presentation the merit in, in um, doing a lot more engagement on our part in the front end and not mm -hmm. depending on industry that they're yeah, going yeah. to engage the partners. So my question is around forming an MOU, even at the planning stage as to, you know, what type of a forum this would be and who gets engaged. And then that can always change into what the previous speaker asked about. And that is a morphing into a governance model. Yeah, that's right. And so for the uh, example for Team IP, we, we created a terms of reference for the stakeholder roundtable. Uh, and sent those to the various interested parties that we felt were either directly or indirectly impacted by this project. So this was a different group than say the province would have identified through their duty to consult requirements. You know, if you're familiar with those aspects, but um, it's, so we, we really took a much broader approach. And uh, so there's that kind of template, I think that works well say this is this is what we want this forum to do and this is who we want to engage and this is sort of the how we intend to proceed uh, and then there's more specific agreements i guess that focus on um, project development so i'm assuming you want the, the former rather than later an example of the former well, I think both are important. Uh, we've made yep. the effort um, to develop a terms of reference for the forum that we have put together. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's now taking it to that next level a little bit after the fact. Okay. But, um, you know, we've got some generic memorandum of memorandums of understanding that are about three quarters of a page. And I'm just thinking that those could be strengthened a fair amount. Sure. Yeah, I can uh, point you in the direction of some templates for, for that that kind of MOU. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Well, with that being said, it is four o'clock, so our time is up. Thank you, Jason, and everyone participating in today. I just want to mention that there will be an evaluation that links sent to you via constant contact, so be sure to check your junk box as a token of our appreciation for your feedback. I just want to mention that every evaluation you enter your name will get entered for a $500 Visa gift card at the end of June. So with that being said, thank you, everyone. Hope you all have a great evening and take care. Bye-bye.
Thank you.